If you're a regular listener to this podcast, then you might remember back in April of this year, we learned the story of the worst sea disaster in the history of the United States Navy. Or maybe you've listened to it since then. I'm referring to the episode talking about the true story behind the movie, USS Indianapolis, Men of Courage. Or maybe you haven't heard it yet. Even if you haven't, it's not a spoiler to learn that the day of that tragic event, the sinking of USS Indianapolis in the North Philippine Sea that marked the end for almost 900 souls, that day was July 30th, 1945. Meanwhile, on that same day, and completely oblivious to the tragedy going on thousands of miles away, a much more joyous event was taking place in the small town of Camilla, Georgia. That's in southern Georgia, about 55 miles or 87 kilometers to the north of Tallahassee, Florida, and about 175 miles or 280 kilometers to the south of Atlanta, Georgia. The joyous event was the birth of a baby boy named John Spence. John would go on to get his bachelor's in English literature from the University of Georgia and a master's from Tulane University in New Orleans. After being drafted into the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War, he was stationed in Germany though, so he never saw battle, John found his military service could be used to get grants for King's College in the heart of London. That's where John worked on a PhD, completing his thesis on the works of the 18th century writer Jane Austen. For decades, he continued to study Jane's life and works, often studying and trying to figure out what he was convinced were hidden messages in her letters. By the time 2003 rolled around, John Spence published his first book on Jane Austen's early life, a book that the world took notice of, especially because he was already considered one of the world's foremost authorities on the life and works of Jane Austen. Four years later, that book was adapted into the movie that we're going to be learning about today. Becoming Jane was released in 2007, and despite only having a budget of about $16 million, not a ton of money as far as Hollywood is concerned, it boasts an all-star cast, including Anne Hathaway as Jane Austen, along with James McAvoy, Maggie Smith, Julie Walters, and James Cromwell, just to name a few. So let's dive into the life of Jane Austen as we compare history with the movie Becoming Jane. I'm Dan LeFebvre, and this is Based on a True Story. Before we travel back to the time of Jane Austen, we need to set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the Based on a True Story podcast, this is a really simple game. I'm going to give you three facts. Two of them are true, and one of them is a lie. The goal is for you to figure out which one of them is a lie. Okay, are you ready? Here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Jane Austen and Tom LaFroy really did know each other. Number two, Tom LaFroy proposed to Jane, but she turned him down. Number three, Tom wasn't the party-loving playboy with a reputation that the movie implies. Okay, got those? Remember them because I'm not going to give you the lie in the episode. I mean, that would mean I'd have to include incorrect information on purpose. <laughs> so in order to tell which one is a lie, you'll have to do that by a process of elimination. Listen closely for the two truths scattered throughout the episode. Then when you hear those, you'll know which one is a lie. Oh, and don't worry, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Okay, one last thing before we get back to the show. Today's episode was a special pick by Andrea, who became an official producer of the show and picked Becoming Jane as the movie to cover. Here's a quick message from Andrea. Andrea from Colorado here, and I asked Dan to do an episode of Based on a True Story on the movie Becoming Jane. I fell in love with Miss Austen when I was in high school and read her novels several times a year. While Miss Austen was not well known before her death, she is now one of the most well-known authors of all time. Becoming Jane is a great movie, but it is very loosely based on Miss Austen's real life. Truthfully, very little is known about Miss Austen as her sister, her main confidant, and the one Jane wrote to the most burned most of their correspondence after Jane died. I hope you all enjoy this episode of Based on a True Story about the movie Becoming Jane.
The movie opens on Anne Hathaway's version of Jane Austen as she's deep in thought. The camera cuts between a few things, showing us that the morning's dew is still on the deep green grass outside. Then we see a clock at 6.15. Dipping her pen in ink, Jane starts writing on the piece of paper in front of her on the desk. Then the camera cuts as she takes a break from writing to play a few notes on the piano. Slowly, the camera pans outside the window and up to the next floor, and that's when we see Jane isn't the only one in the house, but everyone else is sleeping. After a moment, the music stops and Jane looks at the paper, then she goes back to writing, clearly finding some inspiration from the brief stint on the piano. Not for long. This time, she goes back to playing the piano and manages to wake up everyone in the house, most of whom aren't too happy at being woken up at 6.15 on what we find out is Sunday morning. Oh, and yes, Jane's father, George, was indeed a reverend, like the movie shows. In the movie, he's played by James Cromwell, while her mother is played by Julie Walters. Although the movie doesn't really mention her mother's first name, probably because it's the same as Jane's sister, Cassandra. Her sister, Cassandra, is played by Anna Maxwell Martin in the movie. There's no mention of a date in the movie, so this opening sequence isn't really something that we can verify, but still, it's certainly something that could have happened because the real Jane Austen was obviously a talented writer, but she also loved music and playing piano. In fact, just recently, the Internet Archive released a digitized collection of some 600 pieces of music from the Austen family, many of whom were copied by Jane personally. She used to copy a lot of music by hand so she could learn to play it on the piano. That was her personal music collection, sort of like how we each have our own library of music on our phones, except I'm glad I don't have to copy down each song that I want on my phone, note by note. I have a feeling if Jane could have access to a smartphone now, she'd say something along the lines of, you kids just don't know how good you have it these days. Okay, maybe not. I'm sure it'd be much more eloquent than that, but it certainly was a different time. Speaking of which, since the movie doesn't really ever mention a year, we don't really know what time it was that Jane Austen lived yet. It's clearly a while ago, but that's something that we can fix with history. Now, there's a bit of a reason why this episode is being released today, December 11th. You see, in five days, it'll be Jane Austen's birthday. She was born on December 16th, 1775. That'll make this Saturday her 242nd birthday. Happy birthday, Jane. But knowing Jane's birthday doesn't really help us knowing when the movie's timeline begins. The movie's timeline starts somewhere between 1793 and 1795, making Anne Hathaway's version of Jane just shy of 20 years old. Why then? Well, even though the movie doesn't mention the timeline in the movie itself, there's plenty of movie reviews that say it's 1795, but I don't know if I really agree with it actually being 1795. I mean, I understand the reason why I've seen some of the reviews of the movie saying 1795. It's because we know from history that that's when the real Jane Austen met the real Tom Lefroy, who's played by James McAvoy in the movie. So yes, Tom Lefroy was a real person, but the movie's timeline is a bit interesting here because it doesn't really show how much time is passing between these opening scenes and when we're introduced to Tom. According to the movie, Tom is a lawyer who doesn't really take his job seriously. At least, that's the sense that we get when we see him partying one night. We don't see the party itself, but we see him with a few girls and one of his friends, Jane Austen's brother, Henry. And then Tom kisses one of the girls the next day, just before rushing into the courtroom way too late. And there's a lot of implications there that the movie doesn't actually show. His uncle, who's presiding in the courtroom, isn't too happy with Tom's behavior played by Ian Richardson in the movie, Tom's uncle is really only known as Judge Langwa, so we don't really learn his first name. We know from history that his first name, though, was Benjamin. The surname of Langwa is correct as well. After excelling at Trinity College in Dublin for three years, in 1793, Benjamin Langwa paid for Tom's education at the beautiful London campus of the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn, that's where Tom studied law. So it's possible some of the early scenes where we see Benjamin Lingua, who actually was Tom's great uncle, before Tom goes to the country, could have been before 1795. That's why I said the movie probably begins sometime between 1793 and 1795. 
Tom and Jane first met in 1795, but there's the few setup scenes before their meeting. And since the movie doesn't really show how much time is passing between those scenes, it's quite likely that there were actually a few years in there. However, after Tom's misbehaving one day in court, according to the movie, his great uncle decides to send Tom to the country to live with some of his other relatives, also with the last name Lefroy. Like James McAvoy's version of Tom says in the movie, the real Tom Lefroy was born in Limerick, Ireland. His birthday was January 8th, 1776, so he was exactly 23 days younger than Jane. Although the movie's storyline says that it's Tom's bad behavior that was the reason for his being sent to the country, we don't really seem to have any hard proof of this. Instead, many historians believe it was more likely that Tom was simply between terms at university. One of the common sources for information about the real Tom Lefroy comes from the 1979 publication of Proceedings of the Huguenot Society of London, or more specifically, an article in there by one of Tom's descendants, J.A.P. Lefroy, called Jane Austen's Irish Friend, Retired Honorable Thomas Langlois, 1776 to 1869. You'll notice that the title of the article refers to him as Thomas Langlois, some others refer to him as Thomas Langlois Lefroy. Still, according to J.P. Lefroy's article, the Michaelmas term ended on November 25th, 1795. The Michaelmas term, by the way, that's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-M-A-S, that's the name for the fall term at Inns of Court, like where Tom was studying law at Lincoln Inn. Oh, and today, that term lasts through Christmas, but that wasn't the case in the 18th century. J.A.P. Lefroy's claim was that after the term came to an end, after the long hours that come from studying law and straining over books in low-light situations, Tom simply wanted to have a change of scenery to help his eyesight before the next term began, which was beginning on January 11, 1796. So that's one theory as to why Tom Lefroy ended up in the country. But there's other reports that combat that claim. For example, in Memoir of Chief Justice Lefroy, Tom's son, also named Thomas, says that his father only had issues with his eyesight while at Trinity between 1791 and 1793. So there might be some debate about the specific reasons why Tom came to the country. But the point here is the story we saw in the movie doesn't really seem to hold up to history. There's nothing to suggest it was a behavioral issue that caused his granduncle, or uncle, as the movie says, to send him to the country. In reality, it's more likely that Tom just wanted to visit his family. Maybe he did want a break, whether or not it had to do with his eyesight. Maybe he just wanted a break between semesters. Going back to the movie, there's a moment where James McAvoy's version of Tom Lefroy suggests to Anne Hathaway's version of Jane Austen that she read a book that's, well, not quite appropriate. There's nothing really too scandalous by today's standards, but with drawings of topless women, and as the movie says, Tom has a reputation, he's clearly trying to impress that reputation on Jane. That specific incident isn't anything we can prove or disprove, but if you pause the movie to read the title of the book Anne Hathaway's version of Jane is reading, you'll see that it's The History of Tom Jones, A Foundling, by Henry Fielding. That's a real book. It was first published on February 28th, 1749. It's also a book that was incredibly popular throughout 18th century England, and it's been compared by some to Jane Austen's own work, Pride and Prejudice. We also know that Tom Lefroy was a fan of Tom Jones, but that doesn't necessarily mean Jane didn't hear about Tom Jones from someone else first or on her own. So even though there's really no hard proof that I could find that Tom Lefroy was the one who introduced Jane to the history of Tom Jones, it's an interesting theory proposed by the movie. That brings us to Tom Lefroy's reputation, as the movie puts it. From the parties in London that got him sent to the country to the idea that he introduced Jane Austen to Tom Jones, a book that did receive some backlash for its originality in the use of prostitution and sexual promiscuity. It's clear what sort of reputation the movie is implying here, that Tom Jones is essentially a playboy. While there are some reports that this sort of playboy reputation for Tom Lefroy is true, Jane's impression of Tom would seem to be a little something different. To learn more about that, here's an excerpt from a letter that Jane Austen wrote to her sister, Cassandra. 
In the first place, I hope you will live 23 years longer. Mr. Tom Lafroy's birthday was yesterday, so that you are very near of an age. After this preamble, I shall proceed to tell you that we had an exceedingly good ball last night. Mr. H. began with Elizabeth, and afterwards danced with her again, but they do not know how to be particular. I flatter myself, however, that they will profit by the three successive lessons I have given them. You scold me so much in the nice long letter which I have this moment received from you, that I am almost afraid to tell you how my Irish friend and I behaved. Imagine to yourself everything most prolificate and shocking in the way of dancing and sitting down together. I can expose myself, however, only once more, because he leaves the country soon after next Friday, on which day we are to have a dance at Ash, after all. He is a very gentlemanlike, good-looking, pleasant young man, I assure you. But as to our having ever met except at these last three balls, I cannot say much, for he is so excessively laughed at about me at Ash that he is ashamed of coming to Steventon, and ran away when we called on Mrs. Lefroy a few days ago. After I had written the above, we received a visit from Mr. Tom Lefroy and his cousin George. The latter is well behaved now, and as for the other, he has but one fault, which time will, I trust, entirely remove. It is that his morning coat is a great deal too light. He is a great admirer of Tom Jones, and therefore wears the same colored clothes, I imagine, which he did when he was wounded. So, maybe Tom was a playboy? It's hard to nail down for sure. Maybe Tom was just putting on a front for Jane so she didn't catch on to that. It's certainly plausible. There's other records that indicate Tom's own family considered him a bit of a playboy, but again, it's really hard to know for certain. Think of it this way. How many times in your own communications through Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, or wherever you communicate with your family and friends, how many times have there been things that have been said about you that might imply... Something that's stretching the truth just a little bit. That's the sort of stuff that we have to try to wade through when trying to determine the actual truth of history from personal letters. Okay, so that letter was dated January 9th, 1796. Or was it the 10th? In my research, I came across a lot of Jane Austen fans and historians who dated this letter as being January 10th. The mere fact that there's some who mentioned the letter was on the 10th is interesting to me, as other historians say with certainty that Tom was born on January 8th, and the letter starts off by saying Tom's birthday was yesterday. If nothing else, that shows how conflicted people are over the letters and the events that are depicted in their words. In either case, technically, it wasn't right after Tom arrived. So, talking about Tom's reputation, as the movie shows... I guess you might be able to argue the case that Tom might have had a reputation when he made his way to his relative's place in the village of Ash in November of 1795, but then was quote-unquote gentlemanlike, as this letter says, just a couple months later. Or maybe it was just that Tom showed only showed his gentleman side to Jane, but probably not. Unfortunately, a lot of what this means is really up for speculation, and there's plenty of theories out there about how deep Tom and Jane's relationship was, or how shallow it was, depending on how you look at it, or even if it would warrant the term relationship at all. This is just my own speculation thrown in here, but when Jane says she could, quote, expose myself once more, end quote, because Tom was leaving the country, that certainly seems to imply something was going on. I don't mean to say that sexually by any means, but in even in that little excerpt, it seems to imply that there's some flirtation going on with Jane opening herself up to Tom's affections. So while it's really hard to verify a lot of these specifics that we see in the movie, the overall gist of something romantic between Tom and Jane certainly is, well, plausible. While it's true there was something there, like the excerpt we just heard from Jane's letter to her sister, Cassandra, it's really hard to nail down exactly how much was there. Many historians and Janeites, or as fans of Jane Austen are called, believe that Tom Lefroy was indeed Jane's first love. Or was it just a crush? Still others believe that it was just that, a crush, and nothing more. It probably doesn't help that after she grew older, as Andrea mentioned at the beginning of this episode, Cassandra decided to burn or intentionally damage a lot of the letters she'd received from Jane over the years. 
That might sound odd to us now, especially for those of us wanting to find out more clues about Jane's relationship with Tom. But when we put it in the context of history, it's not so strange. After all, think of those letters like your private communication. That's what they were. They were the Facebook Messenger, the WhatsApp, or the Snapchat of their day. Although Snapchat automatically deletes messages just a few seconds after they're displayed. And at least Cassandra kept them around for years. She just had to delete them manually. As disappointing as it is to have lost the letters, especially since I can only assume she started by destroying the letters with some of the more juicy bits of information in them, I can understand the reasons why she wouldn't want her sister's private life kept around for all the world to know. Going back to the movie, Tom Lafroy isn't the only gentleman caller interested in Jane. We find out that another man named Mr. Wisley is being set up by his aunt, Maggie Smith's character, Lady Gresham. Mr. Wisley, by the way, is played by Lawrence Fox. Both Lady Gresham and Mr. Wisley are fictional characters made up for the film, but their purpose in the storyline is one that's based in history. In truth, Jane Austen had quite a few men who tried to woo her. For example, there was a student of Jane's father named John Warren, who is played by Leo Bill in the movie. A lot of historians believe that John had a romantic interest in Jane, while others suggested perhaps they were just good friends. Or there was a man named Samuel Blackall, who was described as an awkward clergyman and had a thing for Jane. Probably the closest to the fictional Mr. Wisley, though, would have been someone named Harris Big Wither. He was a nice and well-off young man who lived near the Austin family. At one point, he even went so far as to propose to Jane. In the movie, Jane turns down Mr. Wisley's proposal. But in truth, Jane accepted Harris Big Withers' proposal. But then, after a night to sleep on it, Jane decided to rescind her acceptance, so the two were never married. So the result was the same, but quite different paths to get there. While we're talking about fictional characters in the film, let's talk about Jane's brother, George. According to the movie, George is deaf and communicates with Jane through sign language. Oh, wait, did I say fictional? George was a real person. Sadly, though, there's just not much that we know about him. We do know that he was about 10 years Jane's elder, and in one of Jane's letters from 1808, she mentioned talking, quote, with my fingers, end quote. But we don't really know if that was because he was deaf, like the movie implies. While it's certainly plausible, some historians suggest that perhaps he had some other type of mental or physical handicap. So others say that George never learned to speak, and that he didn't live with the Austin family, but rather lived out much of his life at a boarding home, along with someone else who's not in the movie, Thomas Lee, Mrs. Austin's brother, who also had mental health issues. Since a lot of what we know in history comes through letters written by the Austin family, and George wasn't mentioned in those letters, there's a lot left to speculation about George. Going back to the movie's timeline, Tom and Jane's romance ends after Jane finds a letter. According to the letter, Tom has been sending money back to his family. Jane, on the other hand, is afraid that if they continue their romance and get married, that Tom wouldn't be able to provide for his family. Of course, Tom insists that it won't be an issue, and for a brief moment they think about eloping. But then eloping would mean leaving everything else behind, and Jane fears the guilt caused by Tom's inability to provide for his family if they eloped would, in time, overcome their love. So she breaks it off with Tom. Unfortunately, we just don't know how much of this is true. As we learned so far, there's a lot we don't know about what really happened. So as far as hard proof is concerned, we're left with the assumption that this storyline is made up for the film. Or perhaps a more accurate summarization would be that this is one theory of what could have happened based on the few pieces of information that we have. What little we do know of their relationship comes from just a couple of surviving letters between Jane and Cassandra, as well as some other information that historians have been able to dig up. From that, we know that neither Tom nor Jane had much money. Tom was indeed reliant on the wealth of his great uncle who financed his education, so a marriage wouldn't have been practical, monetarily speaking. So the path the movie takes to show those plot points could have happened. We just don't know if things happened exactly as the movie shows. We already learned a bit with one of Jane's letters to Cassandra from January 9th, 1796. 
We get another peek at the end of their relationship just a few days later. This is an excerpt from Jane Austen's letter to Cassandra dated January 16th, 1796. At length the day is come on which I am to flirt my last with Tom Lefroy, and when you receive this it will be over. My tears flow as I write the melancholy idea. William Shute called here the other day. I wonder what he means by being so civil. There is a report that Tom is going to be married to a Litchfield lass. John Lyford and his sister bring Edward home today, dine with us, and we shall all go together to Ash. I understand that we are to draw for partners. I shall be extremely impatient to hear from you again, that I may know how Eliza is and when you are to return. So, again, that's just a very brief excerpt. And really, a lot of it didn't have to do with Tom itself, but you can tell that with the, quote, my tears flow, end quote, Jane obviously had some feelings for Tom. By the way, if you want to hear the entirety of these letters that we've heard excerpts from, those will be bonus episodes for the Based on a True Story producers. So it would seem that the movie is correct in showing that Tom Lefroy married someone else not Jane. According to the movie, though, we get the implication that Tom Lefroy was the inspiration behind Mr. Darcy in Jane's classic novel, Pride and Prejudice, which we see her writing at the end of the film. Years after their romance, we even see an older Tom come to hear a reading of Jane's book, and he introduces her to his daughter, who he has named Jane. The final text on screen says that Tom really did name his eldest daughter Jane, that is true. Well, not the meeting between Tom and Jane and Tom's daughter, also named Jane. There's nothing to suggest that reading actually took place. But it's true that Tom had a daughter named Jane. On March 16th, 1799, Tom Lefroy married a woman named Mary Paul. While we don't know if she was actually named after Jane Austen like the movie suggests, Tom's daughter, or his oldest daughter, was named Jane Christmas Lefroy, and was born on June 24th, 1802. Although, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Tom's mother-in-law was named Jane Paul, so it's also possible that Jane was named after his wife's mother. That theory seems to hold up, since Tom and Mary's first child was a boy they named Anthony Lefroy, who was born on March 21st, 1800. However, Tom's father's name was Anthony. So, it's very likely that they named their first boy after Tom's father and their first girl after Mary's mother. A common thing for parents to do. But that still hasn't stopped people from considering that perhaps Tom's daughter was named after Jane Austen. Tom and Mary would end up having eight children in total, the others being Anne Lefroy, who was born on April 25, 1804, Thomas Paul Lefroy, born on December 31, 1806, Jeffrey Lefroy, born on March 25th, 1809, George Lefroy, born on May 26th, 1811, Benjamin Lefroy, born on March 25th, 1815, and last but certainly not least, Mary Lefroy, born on December 19th, 1817. Sadly, Benjamin never lived past his infancy though, so many records actually list Tom and Mary as having seven children. Something else the movie's final text mentions is that in her short life, Jane Austen wrote six of the greatest novels in the English language. It then goes on to say that neither Jane or Cassandra ever married. That is all true. Well, sort of. If you've listened this far, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say you're a Jane Austen fan, or at least you've heard of her works. But there's some who might take issue with the number of Jane's novels being six. You see, Jane Austen published four novels while she was alive. Despite this, though, most of the true fans of Jane's work agree that there were six novels completed by Jane during her lifetime. It's just that two of them were published posthumously. But there's no doubt that Jane Austen is one of the most well-known authors in history. The four novels she published during her lifetime were Sense and Sensibility, published in 1811, Pride and Prejudice, published in 1813, Mansfield Park, published in 1814, and Emma, published in 1815. As 1816 rolled around, 
Jane began feeling a bit under the weather. She ignored this, though, and rewrote the last couple chapters to a book she referred to as The Elliots. It would later be published posthumously under the title Persuasion. In January of 1817, she began a new novel she called The Brothers. Her illness progressed, and on January 27th, she stopped writing. We know this date specifically because she wrote the date at the end of the manuscript. Then, at some point, she picked up the manuscript again and kept writing. About 11 chapters later, Jane wrote another date in the manuscript, March 18th, 1817. That would be the last time Jane Austen would add to a work that ultimately would be left unfinished. By the time April arrived, Jane rarely left her bed. She had difficulty walking and was constantly without energy. Her brother, Henry, and her best friend, her sister, Cassandra, helped care for her during her final days. Sadly, we don't know much about how Jane Austen died. We know from some of her letters that she was running a fever, had bouts of nausea and vomiting, or as she referred to them, bilious attacks and aching. Some of our best estimates are that it was probably Hodgkin's lymphoma, or maybe Addison's disease. On July 18th, 1817, Jane Austen became the first of her siblings to pass away. She was only 41 years old. As for the book she was writing at the time of her death, The Brothers, we now know it as Sanditon, it remains unfinished. It wasn't until after her death that Jane Austen became a household name. After her death, Cassandra and Henry worked to publish both Persuasion and Northanger Abbey, the two books she had completed but hadn't published before her death. Thanks in part to this publication, Jane's work as an author started to gain some recognition, but really it wasn't until 1833, about 16 years after Jane's death, when a publisher named Richard Bentley included Jane's work in his series called Standard Novels. Her works weren't the only ones included in this series, but it was really the first time that Jane's novels were available at a cheap price, something that really helped catapult Jane Austen's reputation. Tom Lefroy lived a much longer life. He passed away on May 4th, 1869, at the age of 93. After he passed away, one of his nephews wrote a letter that helped solve a bit of the mystery about his true feelings for Jane Austen. My late venerable uncle said in so many words that he was in love with her, although he qualified his confession by saying, It was a boyish love. As this occurred in a friendly and private conversation, I feel some doubt whether I ought to make it public. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. To learn more about the life of Jane Austen, I'd recommend starting with the book that the movie was based on, It's called Becoming Jane Austen and was written by John Spence. Although technically the movie was really just based on a single chapter in that book, the chapter about Tom and Jane, but the rest of it is definitely worth a read. I'll add links to that book and many more resources for you to dive into the life of the real Jane Austen and Tom LaFroy over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. And don't forget, if you'd like to get the bonus episodes supplementing this episode, as well as all the other bonus episodes, you can do that by becoming an official producer of the show over at patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. Before we get to the answer to our two truths and a lie game, here's another five star review. This one comes from Luke Gray on Facebook, and it says, been listening to this podcast for a while now, and it is really well researched and brilliantly presented by Dan. Find out the truth behind all the movies you love. Thanks so much, Luke. I'm really glad that you're enjoying the podcast as much as I enjoy putting it together. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Jane Austen and Tom LaFroy really did know each other. Number two, Tom LaFroy proposed to Jane, but she turned him down. Number three, Tom wasn't the party-loving playboy with a reputation that the movie implies. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is number two. As we learned, we just don't have a lot of information about the depth of Tom and Jane's relationship. But of what we do know, there's nothing to suggest that Tom ever proposed to Jane or that she turned him down. 
Of course, one could argue that maybe it did happen and we just don't know about it. And I guess that's true. But then again, there's a lot of stuff in history that might have happened that we just don't know about. Oh, and if you thought it was number three, well, I guess you could be right there too. I'll give you that. There's certainly a lot of people who suggest that Tom was indeed a playboy and maybe it's true that he just didn't show that side to Jane. Knowing the truth about things like this is one of the really difficult aspects when our version of history comes from letters, personal letters no doubt, and little bits and pieces that we're trying to fit together to see the overall puzzle when there's just so much that we don't know. Before we wrap up, I wanted to say one more thanks to Andrea Hill for becoming an official producer of the show and recommending this episode. I'll admit I hadn't seen Becoming Jane before she recommended it, but I had a ton of fun diving into the history, especially for a story like this where there's just so much we don't know. It's really fun to think about what might have been. Thanks again, Andrea. Before we wrap up, I want to say one more thanks to Andrea Hill for becoming an official producer of the show and recommending this episode. I'll admit I hadn't seen Becoming Jane before she recommended it, but I had a ton of fun diving into the history, especially for a story like this where there's just so much that we don't know. It's really fun to think about what might have been. Thanks again, Andrea. Got a movie that you want to see covered? There's plenty of ways you can get a hold of me. I hang out in the Facebook group, the Based on a True Story Facebook group, that is. You can also follow the show on Instagram, where it's at Based on a True Story Podcast, where I like to post images of the real faces and places mentioned in Becoming Jane and other movies that we cover here on the show. You can also find me on Twitter, where I'm at Dan Lefeb, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B, or if social media isn't your thing, you can shoot me a good old-fashioned email at dan at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Lastly, I want to point out that I love getting recommendations for movies to cover here on the show, and every time I get a recommendation, I definitely do add it to my list. There's currently about 200 or so movies in that list, which means if I'm doing this weekly, it could be literally years before I get to a movie that you recommend. So if you want to see your recommendation for a movie to cover get pushed to the front of the line to guarantee it'll get covered, you can do what Andrea did and become an official producer of the show over at patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.